coming up on Theater Talk. Oh, oh my gosh. gosh. I am out of here. Oh, guy. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. Timing is everything mm -hmm. in the theater. Yeah. And at the moment that I sat down to watch this show and watched people behave as if other people mattered and their condition was more important than my own condition was so profound suddenly. It felt like this was the time, if there was any time in history for this show to land, it came at the right moment. So to speak. And you know, that's maybe not the, the, the definition of art, but it's certainly in the, in the definition of, of entertainment. Does that apply to sweat? Sorry? The play Sweat? You th I well, think that's a very yes. good... Um, um, we're not even in the same no, universe of yeah, seriousness. Yeah. Oh, all right. Yeah, uh, yeah. Same, same idea, exactly. She was, her, I think yes. the genius of that show, which sweat, strikes me yeah. as which prize show? bait. By Lynn Nottage, right? Yeah. The sweat it strikes me as prize bait, that show. <laughs> um, it got the Pulitzer, so it worked. Yes, it really is prize bait, but it, uh, it, it's prescience. That's what yes. that show is, because nothing in the show itself is particularly edifying. Yeah. And we should say it's about it's Lynn Nottage's mm. sort of take on the working class people who who voted are, for Trump. A labor, it's labor not, strife. It's not prize bait. It was written before anybody knew who Donald Trump was outside New York. Right. Remember, the show has a long history. Oh, yes. And it was not changed along the way. It was based on research of hers that went back to 09, 08 or 09, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, so there's there's no research in these communities. Yeah, in sometimes these sometimes I think the back story of Sweat actually makes Sweat more important than seeing the play. I think make the play an incredible is a, extremely well mm. done, and I think it's um, it's a you know a naturalistic depression era play, only it's our depression. That's well said. Yeah, mm -hmm. and incredibly well executed. I mean, both as a production and as a play. I saw it where it originated in an Oregon at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Was and it good then when you it saw it? Was, well, I mean, it was a different cast, but it was exactly the same production directed by uh, Kate Wariski. And I thought, this show has got legs, mm. and it's going to travel. And sure enough, it did. Mm. But can it win the Tony Award? Uh, I think maybe A Doll's House Part Two. Did you like that, Elizabeth? I didn't care much for it. I, it, fe it feels like a class assignment to me, mm. more than a play. Mm. Uh, it's, uh, and I really like Lucas Nath. Is that how you pronounce his Lucas Nath? I've liked the plays by him that I've seen off Broadway. Mm -hmm. uh, what strikes me about this play and another one that's not here, but that was also on Broadway that just closed significant other mm -hmm. is, okay, think this is a season where Lynn Nottage and Paula Vogel made very belated Broadway debut. Paula Vogel with Indecent. Indecent. And now we have Lucas Nath and Josh Harmon, uh, who did significant also making their Broadway debut. And I think this shows that the bar is much lower for men to make their Broadway debut. Because those are not... I mean, I don't understand why Lynn Nottage and Paula Vogel have waited so long with great plays in the past to be on Broadway. And these two guys come in. Significant Other is charming. It's a trifle. Mm -hmm. did, he go, did he need to go to Broadway? I don't think so. And I would say the same about Doll's, Doll's House. Ruin so would have I gone think... to Broadway, but they couldn't get a house. <clears throat> what? Yeah, Ruin, ruin would have well, gone to Broadway. Ruin, ruin was ruin. a better Lynn play. Well, you know, play Water could ruin was a better play. Water could have. Yeah, we could go on, but I, I, that to me is kind of, and it's a, you know, a play a, a year when there were, I think, what, like eight plays by men and two by women on Broadway. Because Broadway only embraces musicals it's, about women written by men. Well, <laughs> you know, and there are women characters who could be played by men. Did you like *A Doll's House* part so. two? I did. I very much liked it. I thought it was beautifully acted. I thought one of the great I things. Like I thought, like Ibsen, I mean, I thought that he really understood these. People, the way I think of Ibsen is as sort of psych as drilling down into these characters and making sure you understand each person's perspective. I felt very much that, that Nath had done the same thing. I also think that I've seen many plays that sort of, this is a very, you know, in vogue thing to riff off classics and turn them into your own. I yeah. mean, it's ha being happened all right. the time. This one actually delivered on what it, and it's a very simple idea. She comes back. That's all you really need to know. I think this play really works. I think it's surprisingly droll. It's funny. 
and it's smart. I never felt any of the stakes in the play. Oh my that God. to me, it huge. was so oh. light. I had, my stomach was in a knot the entire I, time. Was it? I oh, thought yeah. it was It was I such it was a flippant tone throughout. And it could have gone either not. way. I, I couldn't more. agree with you more. And, and not oh, knowing how it was The tone was so flippant. Wait, you don't care what happens. She gets a divorce, she doesn't. Who cares? These are all, I think this oh. is all, you know, beside the point, the play that should win the Tony for me is Oslo. Okay, now what? Oh my God. Okay, we got Calm down. Calm down. Oslo. Calm down. Well, our Oslo is about the Oslo peace accords and the Norwegian couple that brought the Palestinians and yes, the Israelis together. And yes, at Lincoln Center peace. Theater, uh, directed by Bartlett Scher, starring well, Jefferson well, Mays and Jennifer well, Ely and a cast of 14. I thought it was, again, um, a model of, that, of w what that kind of play tries to do. The hardest thing in the world Historical is to make... Drama to make geopolitical bargaining into a drama <laughs> that lasts almost three hours and feels like two. Mm. And it's very, very well made, and it's this deep. Oh, I disagree. It's so shallow. It's a big picture. It's, it's a, you know, I like that he sit, stands back, because American playwrights tend not to do that, yeah. you know, yeah. to stand back. It's, it felt like an English play, the kind of... David Hare movie. kind of a... Yeah, not quite as smart as David Hare. So... <laughs> Um, David Hare is really smart. He's really smart and he's, he's meaner, you know. I really appreciated that it was that he, they went after a big picture and tried to tell a big story and they told it really well and I thought it was really shallow. Elizabeth, yeah. you didn't I, like I actually think that's the prize bait play. That's totally a prize bait play. And also actually <laughs> geopolitics are fascinating. Like how can you go wrong with that stuff? The material is fascinating. And Fascinating, I, Vincent Telly. I know, it doesn't record. really sell, but... Before we get away from a doll's house, <laughs> I'd like to, I think we should say a word about Chris Cooper. Could we please have this man on stage? He is maybe one of the greatest character actors in American film. He plays Torvald in the he, Yeah, and he, he can do it on stage as well. And I was enthralled, I was really wondering, you know, because you can't always make that jump. But of course, in fact, Chris Cooper has extensive stage experience and classical training. It's 20 years in the past, but it's all still accessible to him. I'm longing to see him do anything he wants to do on stage. Um, we got to wrap it up. But, but so one thing about oh. why isn't indecent oh, yes. prize bait? Yeah, oh, I right. think right. indecent. Yes. I believe indecent is the play of the season for me. Paul I agree. Paul. I'm with you. I don't need it. I want to ask I you guys, Terry, Terry singles out Chris Cooper. Uh, a performance this past spring that you saw, Linda, that you think should not be missed? Katrina Link in Indecent. <laughs> and <laughs> and in plays. the band's visit. <laughs> and in the band's visit. Yeah. Oh, what a good show that was. Yeah, yeah. that was great. Elizabeth, a performance that uh, stands out in your mind? For me, it was very interesting to see the two little foxes. Oh, right, Laura uh, Linney and Cynthia Nixon. See both. It's, uh, you know, they're trade and parts. One, the sometimes one plays Regina, the, the lead, and some, oh, sometimes one plays... Beautiful. Anyway, they trade <laughs> Laura Linney and Cynthia Nixon. It's really fascinating to see the plays back to back mm. and compare. And, you know, the rest of the actors don't change. Right. I was captivated. I love seeing that show twice. And Peter? I thought Danny DeVito, oh, absolutely. who has done two Fabulous. plays in his life. <laughs> yeah, yes. one, he was one of them. In the price. In the, I, art was in the price. He's yes. it, just a revelation, and he's another one I'd like to see come back. Yeah, yeah absolutely. All right. Thanks a lot, guys, for um, slicing and dicing. Uh, I hope... I hope all you people whose shows they Shop. destroyed, people whose shows Shows the they way. Destroyed. Peter Marks from the Washington Post, Terry Teacher from the Wall Street Journal, Elizabeth Vincentelli from the New York Times and the New Yorker, and Linda Weiner, formerly of well, Newsday. Well, at this moment, I'm of Newsday. At the time of this Tape this line. taping, I'm I'm it. To you, and Linda. Linda. You're here. You're here. Thank Thank you. You. Don't 30 go years. far. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. All right, guys. All you gotta do is just believe you can be who you want to be, sincerely me. So I'm going to ask all of you, what was your favorite production or performance this season? We'll start with you, Jesse Green. Undoubtedly, Peter Brook's Battlefield, a one-hour distillation of the great classic eight-hour Mahabharata at mm. BAM. Yeah. Patrick Pacheco. Sunday in the Park with George, a brilliant revival of the Stephen Sondheim classic that was reflected in the pointillism of George Seurat. Elizabeth Vincentelli. The Glass Menagerie, harsh, brutal, no mm. sets, no music, yeah. no accents, no lights, almost unbearable. Devastating. Yeah. Mike Devastating. Weedle. 
Well, you know, I'm a Chekhovian, so I thought the um, the present, which is an updating mm. of the great uh, Chekhov first play, Platonov, with Kate Blanchett, was something that really told you how difficult existence is. So I would say the evisceration of the patriarchal dynamic in a doll's house, too. Mm. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Michael Musto. Lucas Steele from Natasha Pierre. Woof! <laughs> Oh. Hubba hubba, he's so hot. Even his name makes him sound like oh. a porn star. Oh, Lucas God. Steele. Oh, oh, I also love Dear Evan Hansen's Ben Platt. Oh, oh my God. God. Yes. Yes. I am oh, out of here. Guy. I love him. Michael. You people don't understand theater like I do. Welcome and bienvenue. Welcome. Français, étranger, stranger. Now, Susan, I love showbiz memoirs, and there's one that's uh, out recently that is one of the best I've read. Master of Ceremonies, a memoir by a true Broadway legend, Joel Gray, who joins us on Hi, y'all. Theater Talk. Welcome back to Theater Happy Talk. Happy to be here. Um, I love this book, Joel, because when, when I read it, it, it occurred to me, you, have, you were involved in every single aspect of show business in the 20th century. I mean, from... Broadway to vaudeville to... Not, not news. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's nothing in showbiz in the 20th century you didn't do. The house that you grew up in was a showbiz household, right? My father was essentially a musician. Mm -hmm. And uh, he just ended up being a comedian Well, how did that happen? Because he played the clarinet. He, was he in played a, the clarinet. Jazz player. And um, he started to make these Yiddish comedy records with all these great Hollywood musicians. And they worked. And I think he had maybe 10 albums. Mickey Katz. And then he went on, but he, he had a career as a comic. With the Borscht with Capades. The, the Borscht Capades. <laughs> and he put me in it. As a, as a little kid? As, well, I was 15. Uh -huh. What did you do? I was never a little kid. <laughs> Were you a song and dance man back then? No. <laughs> I was a, just a, an actor. I never thought I would sing or dance. Really? was nothing that interested me. All I cared about was the theater. So what did you do at Borscht Capades? Um, I don't know. Tried to get away with it. <laughs> you know, because I couldn't sing and I couldn't dance, but I had a lot of energy. Hmm. So I got away with it. Where did your interest in the serious theater come from? Because you were at the Cleveland Playhouse. At when nine. That was it. That's all I ever thought I would do. Was ser a serious actor. As a kid, were you interested in Shakespeare and Shaw and Pirandello? Yes, you yes. knew all those playwrights as a yes. little, little kid? Yeah. How? Just loved it. And I had people at the Cleveland Playhouse who somehow thought I was an actor. <laughs> and I believed them. And what did your showbiz family make of your interest in the serious strange. side? Strange. The they thought I was strange. Really? But they, they were proud of me. Uh -huh. I mean, they were my mom, my mom and dad, but they didn't know where I came from. <laughs> <laughs> Did they ever worry, how are you going to make a living if you're just going to do Chekhov and Shakespeare? Right. Really? I wanted to go back to uh, UCLA when I was 18 and study drama and be, you know, uh, more of an intellectual. Mm -hmm. And my, I had an offer to play at the Chez Paris mm -hmm. in Chicago with this nightclub act that I despised. <laughs> And my father said, it's a job. Yeah. They're going to pay you. <laughs> and I listened. And you took it. And then, fast forward, you were on the Eddie Cantor show. Are you Joel Gray? Well, yes, I'm Joel Gray. I have something for you. Giving this remarkable performance, <laughs> which sort of shows so us. embarrassing. I jumped. Yes. <laughs> you know, some people dance. I jumped. How did the Joel Grey, the, the Broadway musical comedy legend, then develop? Stop the World, I Want to Get Off. That was the first real... I mean, I was in uh, Come Blow Your Horn. Yeah. But in terms of a, a bravura musical comedy, musical theater, uh, Stop the World was the beginning for me. Mm. And, and in your book, you're writing about having emotional troubles during that production. And I thought... Don't, don't you, you have, something was going on with you psychologically during that production. Yes, my marriage was in trouble. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and when your course, career is taking off. What was that, so, so what was that production like? Did you just naturally know how to dance, know how to sing? No, no, I, when I finally realized 
that I probably was going to be doing something musical. I studied daily dance, and I studied daily singing. I had some of the greatest teachers, and I ended up, you know, knowing how to to do it. Mm. But it was totally foreign. I thought I was going to be Laurence Olivier. <laughs> it's not Peter, too late, Joel. Or Peter Laurie. <laughs> But then when everybody came out to see you, you were in Chicago and on touring, that, and then they saw, no, here's a Broadway star. Here's somebody who's you got the potential. You saw it in Chicago, didn't you? Yeah, who's got the potential to carry a show. There you are. When did Fosse come into your life, Bob Fosse? Do you remember when you first met him? Yes, he was a, uh, he had a partnership, a dance act, yeah. Fosse and Niles. Right. And I remember thinking, oh, if I could only be like him. Because <laughs> he was like the darling of Broadway. So it was very odd that we ended up in this other relationship because of the movie, mm -hmm. because he didn't want me in the movie. Cabaret. In, in the movie of Cabaret, because he wanted to create it from the get-go, from the bottom up. Didn't want anybody connected with the Broadway show. Hmm. And um, he got stuck with me. <laughs> Why? Uh, Did you have a deal with your contract that you had to be in the movie, or no? As a matter of fact, we both had Sam Cohn, <laughs> the legendary agent. as an agent, and the the story goes that it was like six weeks before we started shooting, and Marty Baum, and Manny Wolf, and all the people involved in the production of the film, Fewer and Martin, mm -hmm. were producer. in a meeting, and Bob walked in and he said. Ladies and gentlemen, this is it. It's, we've got to make this decision. It's either Joel Gray or me. <gasps> and Marty Baum said, then it's Joel Gray. I don't think that's ever happened <laughs> to an actor. <laughs> you know, because it's a director's medium. Right. He was saddled with you. He was stuck. Right. And, and he, he made it clear he was not happy with you. For months. <laughs> How do you handle that? Yeah, you, How do you, you describe this struggle? How did that manifest itself the most vividly? It's in the book, but it's... I had confidence having, you know, played it on Broadway. And, and won had, the Tony. And had acceptance. Mm -hmm. And um, so I had to just keep very focused. And everybody else was, was wonderful. Liza was adorable and, you know, supportive. And we had a very good time. And... I think that there was an odd thing that developed in that we challenged each other. Un it was unspoken, mm -hmm. but he was always making me, putting me in a, you know, in, a, in a very difficult position. And I said, oh, God damn it, I'm not going to let that happen. <laughs> and so I was fighting for it mm -hmm. all the time. And he ultimately, I think, saw that I had something to offer. <laughs> yeah, hello. <laughs> of course, my, my real private belief it was that he's a great director. Yeah. And that somewhere along the line, I think, he always wanted to perform. And maybe he thought, if, I, if he got rid of me, he could... Oh, they would have to take him. Really? That's interesting. Now, Joe, one of the threads that runs through your book very strongly is the fact that you were, uh, what I say, closeted homosexual. You were not out as a homosexual until very recently, in, in your early 80s. But you're writing about how you were kind of had a double life throughout your career and, and really uh, make such a strong, give one such a strong feeling of how, how difficult it was, how difficult it was in your it was difficult yeah. for anybody who had any idea that that they loved same sex. Yeah, yeah. Anybody. Yeah. It was hard. It was another world, and it was just not okay. Mm -hmm. When did it break through that you finally felt? I mean, I know you had a, a marriage for a very long time. You have two twenty-four years. Yeah. Um, I think doing the normal heart uh -huh. yeah. and realizing the. power and sadness and issues that came up in that, there was no way ever to hide from myself. 
Do you remember what the, when you first did Cabaret on the stage in Hal's production, what did those early audiences make of it? Oh, it was so shocking. Really? Yeah, I think they it was just, I mean, there was a lot of talk about the recent production being so much more daring and edgy. People were, I mean, they didn't know what to do with that original production. Hal's production mm -hmm. was so edgy. Can you be more specific about what was the most shocking thing to 1966 audiences? Everything that they saw in the opening number, nobody had any idea that they would ever see that. Which was? This outrageous German Nazi um, sexuality. Mm. I mean, the girls used to lie down on the edge of the stage, put their feet up like this, and people were sitting right here. <laughs> That's 1966. It was so shocking. And wonderful. Yeah. Ron Field and Hal Prince, I mean, they, they just, they had another artful darkness about that collaboration. And um, it was a scary, scary show. And people would walk out after Tomorrow Belongs to Me at the end of Act One. Yeah. And it was quiet. <laughs> now, how much of this sensibility of the show was contributed by Candor and Ebb with their score? I think everybody did their best work and were led by Hal in a certain direction so that the excellence, Ron Field, Pat Ziprot, the yeah. costumes, you were also wonderful in the revival of Chicago, now going on 20 years on Broadway. But what I found remarkable about your performance was, if I'm not mistaken, the original Amos was Barney... Martin. Barney Martin, who is a big guy. Yeah, and, and the, wonderful. Right, and the joke, though, was... I you know, thought they were crazy when they I called me. I was going to ask you, why did they called you? And they said, well, I'm not right for this part. He's supposed to be a big guy. The joke is I'm Mr. I Cellophane, no. even though I weigh 300 pounds. I said no. Why? Because... I thought that's just miscasting. I'm not a dumb mechanic. <laughs> I have other things. <laughs> so who lured you in? Walter. Bobby, the director, yeah. And Anne Ryan King mm -hmm. said, we'll figure it out. And we talked about it, and I said, I don't think dumb is my main thing. Right. That I emanate. <laughs> maybe it is, and maybe I'm that dumb. Um, I said, I think that Amos loves Roxy with such a purity that he's not a jerk. Mm. He's not dumb. He's actually, he's probably the only lover in the show. Where did you come up with that wonderful, the cellophane when you shake the hands and then you begin to sway, the, the Joel Gray sway that I've never seen anyone quite be able to do the way you did it. Is that just the... That we did it at Encores. Yeah. Nobody knew it was even gonna be a success. No, no, no. But did you choreograph that stuff with Anne or did she come up with it for you or you guys just... You never know with, with stuff like that. Yeah. You know, that comes from three sensibilities. But also how about from your history in show business though? I mean your knowledge of the stuff that your father did, the clubs he worked in, the, the, the Borscht Belt stuff, the old, almost the old vaudeville stuff. You seem to embody that in, in your that characterization. Was, he was a vaudevillian. He was. So you had, you had that somewhere in you. I did. Yeah. It's lost though now. Do you, young performers today, can they move the way Joel Gray or Robert Morris can move? <laughs> I'm the wrong person to ask. <laughs> yeah, it's just a, it's a kind of performing that is, I guess it comes from the golden age of Broadway. It's, it's, I don't think it's going to be there for much longer. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of a hand. Wait a minute. 
Ah. <laughs> Look at this. Can you? Look at him. Da, Look at da, da. Am I doing it all right? Am I? Yep. Am I've got. We this. can work after the, after after the, the uh, show. <laughs> was there ever a moment in your career where you had the height of Broadway and you won the Oscar? Was there ever a lull after that? Was there ever a moment where you suddenly Joel Grey is not every other year? <laughs> really? Of you course. went through some troughs, though, right? Some yeah, times where absolutely. What do you do to keep everybody it? does right? But what do you do when you've won the Oscar and you've won the Tony and you are, you know, leading man on Broadway and then suddenly where, where are the jobs? What does one do in one's life then? I don't know. It happens to almost every actor I know. Mm. But you survive through it. If you love it and you get another job, <laughs> you're back in business. And if you want to uh, learn about an amazing life in show business, uh, pick up Master of Ceremonies, a memoir by Joel Gray. Uh, it's always a pleasure seeing you, Joel. Thank you very much for being so our guest tonight. So glad to be here. On Theater Talk. I'm going to work on the... Uh... <laughs> yeah. Oh, see, you know something? Just, the way you do with it, I can't even... Just... I can help you. <laughs> see, I, I just, I, I, I'm too stiff, but you just, the way you did it, do that little hand thing. It flutters. That's it. <laughs> That's the Master of Ceremonies at work. Never even know. <laughs> I'm there. Hope I didn't take up too much of your time. <laughs> Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you.